So this uh, lecture will be about dynamical mean field theory. That's a approximate method to solve uh, lattice, correlated lattice systems. As in, in any type of mean field theory, the, the basic idea is to map a lattice problem to a single site effective problem, which uh, in this case is a so-called quantum impurity uh, problem. So the idea is to map the lattice to a self-consistently uh, defined quantum impurity uh, problem. So let us take as an example for the lattice problem the uh, Hubbard model. So we have the single band Hubbard model. So this uh, model describes uh, electrons which hop around uh, some lattice. Sorry? I should. Well, two. Oh, I see. Okay. No. Okay, good. <coughs> so here we have the lattice, the lattice system. Electrons hop around this lattice with some uh, hopping amplitude t. And they interact on each of these lattice sites with some repulsion energy U. So the Hamiltonian for this model uh, looks as follows. We have the kinetic term, which describes this uh, hopping between nearest neighbor sites. And then we have a local term which describes the interactions on each site and also a chemical potential term. Now in this uh, dynamical mean field theory, this lattice problem is mapped onto a single site model, which uh, consists of one correlated site in an uncorrelated medium. So that's the so-called Anderson impurity model. So we have one site with interaction u, and then uh, in principle infinite path of uncorrelated sites with some uh, energy epsilon of k, and then there is a, a hopping or hybridization v of k between this uh, interacting site and the bath. So the Hamiltonian looks as follows. We have uh, a hybridization term which describes this uh, electron exchange between the impurity and the bath.
That's this term. Then we have a term describing the non-interacting bath. And then we have also a local term uh, which describes this impurity with the interaction U, which is the same as in the original lattice problem. And we also have a chemical potential term. So these A operators are for the bath, and the C operators for this uh, impurity. And now we optimize these parameters of the bath, these hybridization amplitudes and the uh, um, energy levels of the bath uh, uh, in a self-consistent way, such that the bath somehow mimics the lattice environment, so that kind of the hopping of electrons from the impurity into this bath, and maybe after some retardation back onto the impurity mimics a process where an electron hops from a correlated site into the lattice, and then after some excursion through the lattice returns to the original site. So that's the idea. Okay, so that's that's the strategy. So these parameters v of k and epsilon of k, these uh, bath parameters, they are kind of the mean field in this uh, approximation. And now we have to define uh, <clears throat> a self-consistent scheme which allows us to optimize these uh, bath parameters. Um, in such a way that somehow the electrons which are sitting on this correlated impurity feel to some extent as if they were part of the original correlated lattice uh, problem. And so in order to enable this mapping, we have to do an approximation. So basically, the approximation which allows us to do this mapping uh, is the assumption of a local or momentum-dependent uh, self-energy for the lattice problem. So the self-energy is sort of the object which describes how interaction effects uh, change the propagation of electrons in the solid. And um, of course, a single site model can only sort of produce a local uh, self-energy. And so if we make this kind of assumption that in the lattice system we have a, a local self-energy, then we can sort of map uh, the lattice problem to the, to the quantum impurity problem, as I shall uh, describe. So the essential approximation is this uh, approximation that the Hubbard model self-energy, which is in principle non-local, can be approximated by the self-energy of an impurity system.
which is local but still uh, time dependent because we can mimic retardation effects by this uh, uh, bath construction. So in practice, it's often useful to uh, work with an action rather than a Hamiltonian. And that allows us to integrate out the bath degrees of freedom, which are non-interacting, and then just uh, represent those bath degrees of freedom through a so-called hybridization function in the action. Then we really just have a correlated site. And this kind of uh, hybridization function, which describes how electrons hop from the impurity into the bath and after some retardation hop back onto the impurity. So the action then uh, has the following explicit form. That's uh, the hybridization term, which describes this uh, hopping into the bath and back. And then we also have the local term, uh, which describes the interaction and chemical potential contribution. That's the uh, impurity action. And in this uh, formulation now, the self-consistency condition fixes this hybridization function. So now the mean field becomes this uh, hybridization function. And this hybridization function can be written in terms of these epsilon and V parameters of the Hamiltonian formulation as follows. Delta in, in Matsubara frequency space, it can be expressed as follows. The hybridization squared divided by I omega n minus epsilon. So it's really only this combination of uh, hybridization and uh, bath energies which, which matter. So it's this object which we uh, want to optimize. Equivalently to this, we can define the Green's function of the non-interacting impurity, which is sometimes called the Weiss uh, Green's function because it's like the Weiss field in, in, in usual or the generalization of the Weiss field in, in the static mean field theory. So 
that's the Green's function of the non-interacting purity problem, and that's related to the hybridization function by this formula. So the two are equivalent. We can either work with delta or we can work with this curly G. And depending on the method one, one uses, one or the other is more convenient. So anyhow, in the end, we now have to define a procedure which fixes us in a self-consistent uh, manner, say this wise Green's function G0, which now plays the role of the dynamical mean field. So this field, mean field, is fixed by the following uh, self-consistency loop. So we start, we start from some impurity problem with a given Weiss field or hybridization function. So we have some G0. Or equivalently, we have some hybridization function. Then we need some numerical procedure to solve this impurity problem, which means we want to compute now the interacting Green's function and the self-energy of the impurity uh, problem. So this numerical procedure is called an impurity solver. We are going to discuss one powerful technique to do this just in a few minutes. So now let's assume we have this method and that gives us now the impurity Green's function and the self energy. Now we somehow have to connect this impurity calculation to our lattice uh, calculation and this we do uh, through this dynamical mean field approximation, which I have already uh, mentioned. So we we now pretend for the moment that this self energy is a good approximation of our lattice self energy. So in the end, we want to optimize the bath in such a way that this is true. But let's assume it's the case we have, we can approximate our lattice self-energy by this impurity self-energy, which in particular uh, means that we have to neglect the momentum dependence or the non-local uh, contributions of this uh, self-energy. And now we have some lattice self-energy, and with this we can compute the lattice Green's function. Follows one I so here in principle we would have the lattice self energy, but now we replace it by the impurity self energy, and that this gives us now a momentum dependent uh, lattice grids function where the momentum dependence comes only from the uh, non-interacting dispersion in this case. And given this uh, momentum dependent lattice Green's function, we can average our momentum to get the local uh, lattice Green's function. We 
then we have the local lattice screens function. And now we somehow have to go back to the impurity side. And now we impose the self-consistency condition of dynamical mean field theory, which is that the local lattice Greens function and the impurity Greens function should be the same, which means that we now try to optimize the impurity system in such a way that the impurity Greens function gives us the local lattice Greens function. That's the, the goal of the whole uh, self-consistent procedure. This we can use now to define a new um, twice Green's function because we have a Dyson equation for the uh, impurity problem. And so we can use now this new estimate for the impurity Green's function, which we have obtained through this momentum averaging and the old self energy for the impurity to get the new uh, bath Green's function just by this usual formula. Here in this uh, calculation, the, say the self energy comes from the previous step from here, and uh, the lattice screens function has been updated here from yeah, from this uh, loop. And with this, we can now continue. We have a new approximation for the Weiss field. We solve the impurity problem. We, we go through this loop a couple of times until this calculation converges. Yes? This? How I get it? Oh, uh, uh, this is. Well, first I compute this by some numerical procedure. That's not easy. So we will discuss how one can do this. And then we use. This is the non interacting G. This, this is the. In no, no, no. This is sort of something equivalent to G0. Yeah, we have to compute it. This, this is uh, to be computed as G0 minus 1 minus uh, G. But that's a heavy sort of a non trivial calculation how to get this. And then. That's right, so that's what we will discuss next. So how, how to get <coughs> the Green's function or any other type of observable for a given, say, hybridization function or wise Green's function.
So there are many different techniques. I would, will not try to give an overview of what, all these different techniques which exist. I will just describe one, which is very powerful, and that's the Monte Carlo technique, which is based on a diagrammatic sort of expansion in the hybridization term, and that's called hybridization expansion. Because we will work in this method with the hybridization function, I will write the impurity model in terms of the hybridization function. And so the idea, which I just sketched, is to expand the partition function we can write as follows, some trace over the time-ordered exponential e to the minus s impurity, that's our partition function, this can be expanded in powers of the hybridization term, which is contained in this impurity function. And then we view the diagrams which we obtain from this expansion as our Monte Carlo configurations and then implement the stochastic procedure to generate all these uh, configurations. Then once we know how to generate all these diagrammatic contributions, we just have to measure the contribution of each of these diagrams to the observable of interest, such as the Green's function or any type of observable. And in order to keep the discussion simple, we will first consider the spinless case. Because <clears throat> for this hybridization expansion, the spinless case is not uh, trivial. And it allows us to understand the main ideas. of a non-interacting impurity coupled to some hybridization, which looks as follows. And uh -huh, we have a chemical potential term. like this. And so now we write our partition function and expand it in powers of delta.
So now we expand this into a power series. And I'm now writing the nth order contribution. So from the power series of the exponential, we get one over n factorial, and then a trace of a time-ordered product of pairs of creation and annihilation operators from these terms. And then we have a product of hybridization functions. That's the expression we get after expanding uh, the partition function in this in powers of delta. Yes. Okay. Ah, oh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so this, sorry, here it's also missing. So the chemical potential term remains in the exponent and we expand only in the first term here. And so each term gives us two time integrals over tau and the tau prime, as you see here, and a pair of creation and annihilation operators at these times, these are these pairs here. And then also a hybridization function whose time argument is the difference between tau and tau prime. So here we have n, n such factors. And now we have basically the <coughs> what we need for a Monte Carlo algorithm. Namely here we have some kind of sum over configurations. So this is kind of a sum over configurations, C. Where a configuration is just a collection of time points on the imaginary time interval. And here on the right, we have the weight of this configuration. That's the weight. Okay. So that's our weight WC. And so if we know the configuration space and the weight of the configurations, then we can use standard Monte Carlo techniques in order to generate all these configurations according to this weight. Now we will have a bit a closer look at these at these weights. What what this is? So how we can diagrammatically represent these weights? So 
So let's look at the first order diagram. Or zero, no, sorry, zero order diagram first. So there are, so this trace here, if we have no creation and annihilation operators, has two contributions, one for the empty and one for the occupied uh, impurity state. So we have sort of two diagrams, which I can plot like this. And like, uh, maybe, oops, like this. So this would be an imaginary time interval from zero to beta. This dashed line represents an empty state, and this full line represents an occupied state. So here we have sort of zero electrons on the impurity, and here we have one electron on the impurity. And so this gets as a weight. Well, what is the weight? The weight is basically now coming from this uh, chemical potential term here. And if we don't have any electrons, then it's just one. So e to the zero is one. And here we have an electron on the impurity. So this gives us e to the mu times beta. So these are the weights of these two contributions, and that's all we have at order zero in the hybridization. Now let's look at the order one diagram. So now we have one creation and one annihilation operator. We have a C dagger and a C operator, and we have a hybridization line connecting these two, which I draw like this. Yes? Yeah, so each hybridization function comes with a C and a C dagger operator. So it means that here an electron is annihilated on the impurity, so it hops into the bath, then it uh, propagates in the bath, and it comes back, it hops back onto the impurity at time tau prime. And that's represented here. So basically now we have occupied impurity in this time interval. So the Basically, the picture is that the electron hops, ho say, hops in at this time, stays on the impurity up to this time, and hops out. So that's more or less the meaning of this. And so what is the weight here? So if this is tau 1 and this is tau 1 prime, then this line here, is e to the mu tau 1 prime minus tau 1. So just the length of this uh, segment here. And then we have a hybridization function, which comes tau 1 minus tau 1 prime. So the total weight of this contribution is just the product of this exponential factor and this hybridization function. That's now one diagram in the order one space. And of course, we can now integrate over all possible positions of these C dagger and C operators. So this is this is the C operator. This is the C operator. And these positions are integrated over. Here we have an integral, and that will generate us all the first order configurations. And 
then we can go to the second order configuration. we can graphically represent like a collection of two such segments. So you can imagine we now insert two creation and annihilation operator pairs like this. And they are somehow connected by hybridization functions. That would be in our order delta squared contribution and so forth. Yes? Yeah, yeah. Impre yes, you're right, yes. So, but that corresponds to a different ordering of the C dagger and C. So in principle, you have to integrate, uh, you have, yeah. I mean, they can be at arbitrary places on this interval. So the other contribution which you mentioned, that would correspond to one like this. No. Sort of where the creation operator comes after the annihilation operator. But at this stage, the <coughs> all possible uh, positions are integrated over. Yes. Now one a point one can realize is that for if we have more than one pair of operators, there are different ways in which we can connect these operators by hybridization lines. I just showed one possible connection, but there are other possibilities. We can connect creation and annihilation operators by hybridization lines. And in total, there are n factorial ways in which we can connect these. And it turns out we can sum up all these n factorial contributions into some determinant. Maybe we should uh, show this explicitly for the simple case of n equal 2. So here we have two possibilities. One is this diagram, which I have already sketched. say this is some length L1, this is length L2, and this is tau1, tau1 prime, tau2, tau2 prime. Then this diagram has the following weight. We have minus 1 squared coming just from the yeah, each hybridization function comes with a minus sign that's just this. And then we have a chemical potential contribution, which is determined by the length of these segments. So e to the mu L1 plus L2. 
And then we have a product of two hybridization functions with the following time argument. So that's the, the weight for this configuration. But there is a different second configuration which has exactly the same operator positions. That's d tau to the power of four. So in principle, this yeah, in principle, these infinitesimals should also be considered part of the weight. Yeah. In principle, this and yeah, it's not important for the following, but in principle, this is part of the weight of the configuration. So the second way we can connect these creation and annihilation operators is this. And also connect them like this. And that gives a different weight, namely the following, minus one to the power of two from the expansion uh, at second order. And then we have a second minus one from this uh, time ordering operator because now if the arrow goes into the opposite direction, it means we have to somehow exchange a pair of creation and annihilation operators, and that will give us a minus sign from the time ordering. Uh, so that is from time ordering. And then we have exactly the same contribution for from the segments, because the segments are the same. Then a different combination of hybridization functions. So now we have delta of tau one minus tau two prime times delta of tau two minus tau one prime. Now we can combine these two if we want as follows. We can write this as minus one squared e to the mu L1 plus L2. And now determinant of a two by two matrix, and with the following matrix. So this uh, contribution will give us the first term, where we have the product delta tau one minus tau one prime, delta two tau two minus tau two prime. And then we have another uh, term, which corresponds here now to the off diagonal elements, delta tau two minus tau one prime, delta tau one minus tau two prime. And now, oh, and we have also the infinitesimal tau to the four. And I think you now already guess what is the general structure. If we have n segments, we can just uh, add all n factorial diagrams up into a determinant which generalizes uh, this uh, structure here. And now the uh, algorithm becomes very nice because we can now forget about the hybridization functions. They are taken care of by this uh, determinant and we can only focus on the time sequence of operators. So in other words, we can only draw these segments 
and then a collection of segments implicitly defines a determinant uh, if we think of summing up all the different uh, diagrams that we can obtain by connecting these segments by hybridization functions in all possible ways. think about the sequence of operators or this uh, segment uh, structure and the weight is then proportional to just this exponential factor with chemical potential times the total length of the segments which I write as length of segments, and then a determinant of a matrix, which I call delta, and that's sort of the hybridization matrix, which is implicitly defined through the sequence of operators, as I explained here for the two, two orbital case. So we can simply represent the, such a configuration by, by some arbitrary collection of these segments. Looks like this. And now you can easily, now we know the weight for such a configuration and you can easily guess how we sample such a configuration. We can now just uh, think of a procedure of randomly inserting one of these segments, randomly removing another segment, and that's how we can sample the entire uh, space of such configurations according to this weight. So this would then be tau 1, tau 1 prime, tau 2. Okay, so this was the non-interacting case. Now, how do we treat interacting impurities? So that's very simple. Once we have this segment picture, we consider the Anderson impurity model with uh, interacting spins. Now we have just one segment configuration for each spin and the hybridization determinant for each spin. And the interaction contribution will be given by the overlaps of these uh, segments for up and down spin.
and let's make a picture. So we now have one time interval for up, one time interval for down, and some segment contribution or configuration for up. Let's say this one, and another one, for example like this, for down. So, I mean, these segments, they now indicate the time intervals where an up electron is on the impurity and where a down electron is on the impurity. That means the interaction happens when both up and down electrons are on the impurity, so it corresponds to the time interval where we have overlaps between these segments. So it's this kind of uh, time which, is, which matters for the interaction. So let's call this L overlap. So basically the interaction contribution will be interaction U times the length of this overlapping segment. And the chemical potential contribution will just be given by the length of the segment. So length for the up and length for the down segment. So we have that the weight is essentially given by this con chemical potential contribution, which is chemical potential times length for up segments, length for down segments, then minus the interaction contribution u times length of the overlaps, and then a hybridization matrix determinant for the spin up, and the hybridization determinant for spin down. So that's now the structure for the interacting uh, problem. And so it gives a very simple intuitive representation for uh, what such configuration means. It really means an electron, down electron hops in here, up electron hops in here, then we have two electrons on the side, they interact, then the down electron hops out, we have only singly occupied side, and then the up electron hops out. And this also gives us very easy way to measure, for example, double occupation. It's just the average length of these overlaps in our configurations. So the occupation is just the average length of the segments and so forth. Green's functions are a little bit more complicated to measure. Um, Maybe I'm not going to describe how we measure the Green's function. So basically what one has to do is one has to remove one of the hybridization lines and then one has a C dagger and a C operator in the configuration and that's a, a Green's function configuration and one then measures those contributions. But that's a, a little bit technical so I will not uh, go into this. But anyhow, so this is one uh, technique which uh, allows us to, to solve impurity problems numerically in a rather efficient way. So in the last half hour, I want to discuss a little bit <coughs> the problem of dynamical screening and what this interaction parameter in the Hubbard model really means and how we should properly define it if we want to simulate the material. Basically, we have the problem of defining our or calculating the Hubbard U in quotes 
for a low energy effective model for some complicated material. So we will consider a typical case where we have one narrow band, say a D band near the Fermi energy, which is separated from other bands, which we can assume to be more weakly correlated. So the situation is the following. We have here our Fermi level. We have some D band near the Fermi level, and we have some other bands, so-called screening bands, near uh, at, at high uh, energies. So now we can partition energy space into a low energy window and a high energy uh, window like this. So we have here our low energy window which spans this or contains this single band near the Fermi energy and we have a high energy space which sort of contains the bands which are further away from the Fermi energy. So this is sort of the high energy subspace, which I call H. Also, this is now considered high energy subspace because we are interested in how far the energy is uh, from the Fermi energy. And then we have the low energy uh, subspace. So these are the occupied states. And ultimately we want to now define a kind of Hubbard type model for this low energy subspace from a kind of up initio calculation. calculate this interaction, we have to compute now the polarization of the system. Because the polarization tells us uh, how the bare interaction is screened and gives us sort of the, the screened interaction which is relevant for the definition of this low energy uh, model. Now the idea is that we separate the polarization into contributions which are associated only with the low energy 
uh, subspace and into contributions which involve the, the high energy uh, subspace. contribution from the low energy subspace we call PL and the rest the contribution from everything else which is not from the low energy subspace is called P PH you know, contributions involving somehow the high energy subspace so we have this uh, two contribution a contribution from the low energy subspace and from everything else. Now the fully screened interaction is basically the bare interaction screened by this full polarization P. called the bare interaction V, the fully screened interaction W. So that's sort of this kind of Dyson equation which relates the bare interaction V and the screened interaction W and the kind of self energy in this equation is the polarization. And this we can re-express in the following form. Now, what is PL and PH? Somehow, um, we can represent this graphically in this picture. The low energy polarization has to do with transitions within the low energy subspace, something like this. Whereas the high energy polarization is everything else, so that includes transitions from occupied states in the high energy subspace into the low energy subspace, like this, or from the occupied states in the low energy subspace to empty states in the high energy subspace, like this, or of course also transitions from occupied high energy states to unoccupied high energy states. So this is all part of P H, and this is part of PL. Now the point is that these polarization effects, these kind of transitions, they should be properly taken care of in our solution of the impurity model. If we sort of, we, we believe that within dynamical mean field theory we can obtain a rather good description of the low energy physics, so we should capture all these low energy polarization effects in our DMFT calculation. So it means that this polarization should not be considered in the definition of the Hubbard U. Otherwise, we would sort of double count the polarization effects. So we have to remove this low energy uh, polarization and only define our Hubbard U 
<coughs> by considering the high energy uh, polarization. So that's why we now introduce the so-called uh, partially screened interaction. So we define this so-called partially screened interaction WH, where we only screen the bare interaction V with the um, with the uh, high energy polarization. write it differently. And you can do a little calculation using this relation and the definition of the fully screened interaction to show that this now implies that the fully screened interaction can be expressed as follows as 1 minus P minus WH PL minus 1 WH, which means that the fully screened interaction is now obtained if we further screen the partially screened interaction by the low energy polarization. And that is exactly what we want. We want to define our Hubbard U or our interaction in the low energy subspace in such a way that if we screen this interaction by the low energy polarization, we get the fully screened interaction. So that's the proper uh, definition uh, of, of the interaction in our low energy model. Okay, so then we have our correct definition of the interaction in the continuum, and now we want to define the interaction in the Hubbard model, and for this we have to construct now localized Vanier type orbitals, and then evaluate uh, the matrix elements of this uh, interaction in these localized one-year orbitals, and that's now our correct definition of the Hubbard U.
So let's uh, call this basis of localized orbitals phi of R, where R is sort of the lattice uh, index. And then we have our definition of the Hubbard U, which is the following integral of space phi i of r squared and this partially screened interaction which depends on r, r prime and frequency phi i of r prime squared. So that's our Hubbard u and the interesting or the important thing here is that it is frequency dependent. So and that comes from the fact that the polarization is frequency dependent. All these transitions, say, all these transitions which contribute to the screening, they have a characteristic energy given, for example, by the energies between different bands. And so this introduces a, a energy dependence into the polarization. And if the polarization is energy dependent, then also this partially screened interaction becomes energy dependent. So V is, is not energy dependent, that's a constant, but uh, this is now frequency dependent, so W is also frequency dependent, and so also our Hubbard U is uh, frequency dependent. So the proper definition of the Hubbard U in a low energy effective model like this is a frequency dependent object which ranges from a very large value. Basically the bare interaction in the solid is very large for transition metals, something like 20 electron volts. And then it is screened by all these high energy bands down to a value of just a few electron volts in the static limit. So if we sketch this typical structure of the interaction, it looks as follows. So if this is our frequency, axis, 
we start from a bare interaction, which is relatively large. And then So this is the real part. Imaginary part would look something like this. And there's usually a big uh, peak corresponding to the so-called plasmon uh, frequency. And so above this plasmon frequency, the screening is not effective anymore and the interaction is approaching the bare interaction value. But below this plasmon frequency, the interaction is strongly uh, reduced. And so that's our partially screened interaction where we have not taken into account the low energy screening from our uh, <coughs> transitions within the low energy subspace. If we would also include this, there would be down here somewhere a second sort of reduction of the screening and and that would then be the fully screened interaction, W. But as I explained in the DMFT type calculation where we explicitly treat this low energy screening, we don't have to take this polarization into account in the calculation of U and we should really use this partially screened interaction which removes the polarization uh, or which does not include the polarization of the low energy space. So this W includes So now one uh, further comment is that these formulas which I had on the board for the relation between screened interaction, bare interaction, and polarization and so forth, these are exact as long as we calculate the polarization exactly. But in practice we don't, we, we are not able to calculate these polarizations exactly. So we use some approximations, typically random phase approximation to calculate the pH, the high energy polarization. This scheme is called constrained random phase approximation, CRPA. That's one of the standard uh, methods nowadays to compute these interaction effects. And so you may wonder why is it okay to calculate the uh, polarization in the random phase approximation? So uh, one argument which is typically given is Precisely this, that the low energy subspace is usually uh, strongly correlated. These are the D bands near the Fermi energy, whereas the high energy subspace is more weakly correlated, maybe S and P bands. And so since we remove the low energy polarization, anyhow, we only sort of treat weakly correlated bands in the random phase approximation, so maybe it's okay. Uh, Yes, yeah, so that's a sort of a general argument. It's not so clear if this is actually true. So uh, we did some tests recently in simple model setups to, to check if, if this kind of downfolding is accurate. And at least in, in these simple model setups which we checked, it's, not, it's not, very, not very good. So there are some question marks. And the last point I want to say is the following. Usually we know that in a Metal, for example, the Coulomb interaction is short range because of uh, low energy screening. So we go from a long range Coulomb interaction to a short range, uh, maybe Yukawa type interaction, thanks to the low energy screening, which is given by this PL. But now in this uh, 
constrained random phase approximation, we remove the low energy metallic screening. So in principle, the interaction again becomes quite long ranged. And so it's problematic that in practice we, we then simply uh, use a Hubbard model description, even though the interaction is not short ranged. And uh, that's a major, I think, flaw in, in, in most calculations up to now that one really then just uses these parameters, uh, only the on-site uh, terms, whereas long range couplings are not are not treated, even though they are not small. They are maybe a factor of two smaller, but they are not negligible to, compared to the, uh, the on-site terms. And so uh, tomorrow, <coughs> tomorrow I'm going to discuss uh, two things. First of all, I will discuss how we can solve Hubbard type models with a frequency dependent interaction. And I'm going to describe a formalism, which is also based on dynamical mean field theory, which can uh, treat long range Coulomb interactions. And that's a so called extended dynamical mean field formalism. And this is really then fundamentally dependent on our ability to treat these. Uh, frequency dependent uh, couplings because they are then somehow self consistently updated if we treat these uh, long range uh, screening from the from the long range coulomb interaction but yeah you know, that's what i'm i'm going to to discuss uh, tomorrow so thank you for your attention